So my talk today is based on a paper that I intend to write uh, with Taneli Vaskelein and Laura Piscelli this summer for a book uh, edited by institutional sociologists on, uh, on the sharing economy and other kind of platforms. Um, and um, uh, the perspective I want to take is an institutional one and not an institutional economic one, which, for example, would be a transaction cost uh, perspective, but an institutional sociological uh, one. And that helps me, even though I'm trained as an economist, uh, I think we have to move beyond solely economic perspective on platforms. We have to move beyond issues like competition, natural monopoly, transaction costs, uh, uh, and so forth. Because in my view, uh, I think there's something more fundamental going on uh, with the rise of uh, platforms that is challenging uh, very basic institutions in, in our society. And the sociologists, and in particular the institutional logics approach, which is more a macro approach in sociology, they provide us not so much with a theory, but a framework in which I can organize uh, a couple of uh, debates that are currently going on uh, about the platform economy. Uh, I also intend this to talk as a kind of introduction, so I, uh, I put uh, the question of the definition and that's uh, hopefully we don't need to bother about it uh, anymore because I choose Martin's definition which is also a very nice and broad one, uh, hard to disagree with. So uh, we talk about platforms as uh, uh, mediators of social and economic interactions online. Uh, and um, so this not only includes marketplaces, but it also includes social media or dating uh, sites or what have you. And uh, the structure of that platform economy is actually a hierarchical one, um, both in technologically and economically speaking, because to run all those platforms, here I listed five main ones, we need meta platforms, we need technology platforms that you use to download your apps to run a particular platform, to interact uh, with others online. Um, uh, and uh, we basically have three of such meta platforms, Apple, Google, and Microsoft. And uh, then we have hundreds of platforms that run on those meta platforms. And what's the user base? Well, uh, I checked it. It's about one third of world population now has a smartphone. And I'm pretty sure all those users use at least one app on that smartphone. Uh, so you could say uh, it's a big, uh, big market, it's a big phenomenon and rapidly growing. Now I put those five platforms uh, because I think if you, uh, yeah, if you would uh, want to describe the history very stylistically, I see five main type of platforms with five, if you like, winners or exemplars of those platforms. Uh, we have e-commerce. Uh, started in the mid 90s and rapidly after also secondhand markets, which is also a retail a platform, but not business to consumer, but consumer to consumer. Uh, and in both cases, we see a clear, uh, a clear winner. Uh, and then, uh, by the way, Marktplatz, the Dutch equivalent of eBay is also owned by eBay, eBay already for 15 years. So that's one and the same company. And then we had to wait for like 10 years to have the social media revolution with Facebook and, and its two billion users. And then, and that's more my own topic, we saw the advent of the sharing and the gig economy, where I distinguish uh, between the two by saying, well, sharing is about renting out or lending out assets. So it's about making more money of your capital. And gig economy is about <coughs> offering your services. Uh, so it's a labor uh, platform. Uh, there are, of course, other kind of platforms, for example, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. We will talk about it. There are games, which is a pretty big market. Uh, but for me, I think the, these are the five main ones. Now, for a sociologist, if you talk about the platform, they will probably say it's a new organizational form. Okay. Uh, and what is new? Well, uh, before the advent of platforms, most markets were uh, oligopolies with few producers uh, serving many users, okay? Uh, so uh, think about retail, car, uh, uh, what, what have you.
few producers and many users and even our own innovation theories, Clapper's life cycle theories, all those theories are really a theory to explain how the, such markets come about and why they uh, end up with that uh, uh, industrial uh, structure. But now we see sector by sector by sector the introduction of platforms that reorganize that industrial structure in a way that we have a single platform or usually one dominant platform with 60 or 80 percent market share that connects many small producers to the same many users okay um, and uh, it has become a triangle relationship uh, and uh, that new organizational form uh, is something uh, is yeah, sociologists uh, have studied before um, uh, by asking the question, what kind of logics underlie this new organizational form, how it's different from the previous organizational forms, and why do we see so many tensions and conflicts arising in this process? And the institutional logics perspective, which uh, you can read about in this book uh, by Thornton uh, et al., um, it's, it's, it's mainly a kind of meta-theory that distinguishes between seven logics uh, that we use uh, to organize our economy, our society, our daily lives um, to provide our material subsistence and meaning um, to our activities. And if you like, uh, historically, these are the seven ones that emerged. So the family uh, was the first. Uh, also the word economy, of course, comes from uh, oikos, from the family, household, then uh, community, uh, so uh, local communities uh, uh, emerged, religion, state, market, profession, and very recent, the modern corporation, okay, which is an invention of roughly 150 years old. And um, they operate under different logics, uh, using different principles. Uh, and, uh, for example, community is about uh, reciprocity, market is about prices, uh, state is about uh, de democratic decision making and the authorities are di differently organized and let's say the objectives of the actors operating in their logic are also different. Now for now th this, this scheme is used basically to study two things. First, uh, particular sectors. So for example you could look at uh, academia uh, what is the dominant prof uh, logic in academia? It's the professional logics. So scientists basically decide uh, uh, about uh, careers, about who gets money, about what gets published. But more recently, market and state logics have increasingly bothered us and we are trying to resist that. So that's a typical institutional logic perspective on a particular sector. Uh, and the second topic they, uh, they, they look at are single organizations and in particular organizations that try to combine multiple logics within a single organization. They call that hybrid organizations. For example, social enterprises uh, trying to, uh, to contribute to community good uh, but also have to make a profit. So, but uh, for, I want to use this scheme to study the platform economy and, uh, and uh, in the following way. If I look at the old economy before the advent of online platforms, I think most uh, industries were dominated by two logics. We had uh, big firms that tried to grow bigger. And uh, by becoming bigger, they achieve market power. And with market power, they can charge a higher price. They can create more profit for their shareholders. And part of this profit is again used to increase uh, their size. So this is an and, and, and a complementary logic, uh, you can call it Penrosian logic of uh, uh, growing your firm while at the same time satisfying your shareholders. And the only conflict between these logics you have to solve is basically to align the incentive of the managers with the shareholders. And there's a lot of economic uh, literature on this. For example, you give managers shares and then you align the incentives of shareholders and managers. So that seems to be fairly well uh, institutionalized. Uh, um, but now we have the platform logic. And my assessment is that 
again, uh, platforms are uh, characterized by these two dominant logics, but now they have become conflicting logics. Why? The platform is a corporation that uh, wants to grow in size. It's a winner-takes-all market. So actually, size is what matters most. And with venture capital, you try to achieve it as fast as possible. For example, by giving away your service for free in the beginning to create these network externalities. But by growing in size, they create a lot of power that is not necessarily in the interest of the freelancers, that is, the people who make use of the platform. Because what do we have? We have a corporation that basically evolves towards a natural monopoly in, and in a way undoes the market logic. Eh? They, they, they try to escape the market logic, but, they, but their company is organizing a peer-to-peer -peer market. Yeah? So we have the two logics, but with different actors. The platform uh, operating according to one logic and the freelancers uh, that uh, make use of the platform that have to uh, earn a decent price uh, to make a, a decent living on the platform. Now, what is the source of conflict if I want to uh, put it uh, in its most uh, fundamental form? I think it's two. First, of, co of course, it's a surplus question. So, the more commission a platform uh, charges, the lower the income of the freelancers. So there is no win-win here. Yeah? Uh, so uh, what they uh, have to pay to the corporation is uh, immediately deducted from their income and immediately uh, put to the, in the corporation logic. So it's a classic question of surplus. Who gets the surplus of the value that is indeed created through a platform because they lower transaction costs and so forth. But the second one, which is more um, complicated, is the issue of control. Because even though uh, uh, the platform uh, creates an, uh, an, an online marketplace, it's not a free market. Yeah? Uh, it looks like the perfect textbook market with many suppliers and many consumers, transparency and so forth. But uh, the corporation polices, yeah, the platform polices who's in and who's out. The platform decides uh, who they think uh, uh, qualifies to be a good uh, freelancer on the platform. They do that ex ante, so by uh, asking uh, references, by asking your passport, um, uh, but more, uh, more so they do it ex post, by uh, having you rated by consumers, also by uh, uh, monitoring you in other ways. And if uh, they feel your service is not up to the standards they want to adhere to, they can ban you from the platform and you have no a possibility to appeal or whatsoever. And that's, I think, a pretty new uh, institution, a, a new kind of governance, uh, because before the advent of this platform, only the state had the right to police and to uh, prohibit people to enter in public spaces, for example, uh, or take away their license to operate. Um, and in some cases, the corporations or the platform even decides on the price itself. Yeah, which of obviously doesn't make it an, 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 a marketplace anymore with free forces of supply and demand. Okay, to make things even more complicated, these platforms do not only kind of reorganize uh, the corporation and the market logic, but they also um, kind of um, reduce the role of the state and the professional logic in uh, many markets. Uh, first of all, uh, the platform doesn't mind if freelancers do not adhere to state regulations. Yeah? They have their own way of self-regulating quality, self-regulating uh, uh, entry and exit to the platform, uh, so you don't uh, necessarily need uh, to adhere to safety standards, um, uh, other kind of uh, regulations that may apply in particular markets. And they also undo the professional logic, because in many sectors, it's the profession that decides who gets a diploma and who can enter into a certain business. But in, on platforms, anyone can enter. You don't need to be uh, a professor to provide an online course uh, on YouTube. Uh, you don't need uh, um, yeah, to, um, to have particular diplomas 
uh, to carry out a uh, profession. So that creates an additional tension about these platforms. But even if you would solve these things, which for example in the Uber case in Europe, we kind of solve these issues because in Europe, Uber only uh, operates with licensed chauffeurs. So in a way they ad still adhere to those state and professional logics. The more fundamental tension is not solved yet because the, the main question is still on the table whether the freelancers that ride for Uber are actually empl uh, employers of Uber. Why? Because Uber acts as an, uh, uh, sorry, they act as an employer of freelancers in the sense that they decide uh, who can operate or not. So then uh, uh, the question is uh, whether, uh, legally speaking, freelancers in, in, in certain cases are actually employees of platforms. So that is my last uh, point that I want to make. Uh, how are, um, am I doing on time? Okay, then I can make this point very elaborately. Um, the, if, 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 if it's true uh, that the tensions and debates, public debates, regulatory uh, confusion, all the tensions we witness today are indeed, yeah, uh, not, not easily uh, solvable because of this fundamental conflicting logic between markets and corporations, then the question is, what's next? So how, how can we then institutionalize these platforms in a way uh, that these tensions will, uh, will go away? And if you adhere to this uh, scheme, I think there are basically five scenarios. Uh, and the soft landing, if you like, uh, so the, 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 the most um, um, immediate solution could be that platforms reorganize their business model, adapt their business model in a way that they either adapt to the existing corporation logic or they adapt to the existing market logic. So what would that mean? It means that if a platform would employ the freelancers that are currently controlled by them and working for them on the platform, they will become a traditional corporation. And in, and in some markets, we see this happening. Yeah? So in the food delivery market in the Netherlands, Foodora, uh, uh, for example, employs the bikers. Yeah? So it is, it is not uh, inherent to a platform business model that you have to use freelancers. You can also uh, have employees and work with uh, temporary contracts, flexible contracts, and still run uh, your business. In another case, you could, uh, um, uh, another scenario would be that the platform reorganizes the business model in a way that the marketplace they're organizing becomes much more a true market. Uh, and this is what we see happen, happening with Helpling, that's the cleaning platform in the Netherlands and a couple of other countries, that uh, in January they introduce flexible prices. So before January uh, the platform would decide on the price and after January the cleaners now decide on the price and they can start to customize uh, their business much more uh, to, to consumers uh, to become a true freelancer. Um, what I forgot, what, what, okay, uh, w whether we will end up in one or the other, of course, may depend on, on the sector and what kind of business model is feasible, but it will also depend on uh, regulatory uh, issues. For example, apart from the question whether uh, a platform that employs freelancers and monitors and, uh, and polices uh, that freelancer uh, whether or not that platform is an, uh, an employer. The other question is, are freelancers, in the face of so much power of the platform, allowed to unionize? Today, in most countries, they are not, because uh, they classify as freelancers, so they are not allowed to coordinate, for example, on prices. Uh, however, there are some recent court cases that suggest that in the certain circumstances, uh, maybe uh, antitrust law should uh, allow uh, freelancers to, to unionize or somehow coordinate. As a side note, even, even if that would be allowed, it, uh, in practice still rather difficult 
because freelancers on platforms don't know each other. There's no email list. And they also come and go and may have different motivations why they do the job in the first place. So the first uh, kind of initiatives of, uh, of freelancers to unionize have been very, very difficult. Yeah? Because there's no a factory door where you can wait and collect your factory workers to join a union. Uh, it, is, it is in practice not so easy. And uh, you've done some research on that as well. Okay, so that is the, the soft landing. We, 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 we are able to institutionalize platforms either as, as an, uh, a good old corporation or, or market. Uh, a third way would be nationalized platforms. And that was historically a typical solution to natural monopolies that the state would take over national railways, uh, for example. And in fact, we see also an example of this with the recent announcement of the French government who wants to start their own WhatsApp service, yeah? also for national security reasons. However, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure if uh, in this day and age, and also given the more virtual nature of these platforms, rather the physical nature of, of, of past uh, natural monopolies, whether, whether that's an, uh, a typical solution. And then the fourth and the fifth solution would be that uh, freelancers vertically integrate and start their own platform. That they become the owner of the platform and also govern the platform by themselves. Uh, and that is now being studied under the heading of platform corporations, platform co-ops. Co and we see, for example, in the US in a couple of cities that taxi drivers uh, pooled resources build their own platform and start uh, only to use that uh, app uh, to provide their services to compete with, uh, with Uber. Again, antitrust law is not uh, clear under what conditions you are allowed to do this. But again, historically, we have already seen cooperatives emerging in sectors where somewhere uh, along the value chain, a very powerful actor emerged and then others uh, started to uh, vertically integrate and start their own uh, dairy fact factories, for example, in the Netherlands. So this is, this is from an economic point of view and historical point of view. Uh, the, the rise of cooperatives, is, it is actually likely to happen. It may not be so likely that it will be successful because running a platform as a cooperative is arguably more difficult than running it as a corporation. The same you can do by uh, organizing a platform uh, through a profession. So we see photographers who run their own platforms. We also see small restaurants starting in their own platforms. So that uh, is, is, and th that can also be done as a cooperative or uh, as an association. And um, my final, more speculative uh, scenario would be that an eighth logic would emerge. I see someone laughing uh, because we have been discussing this and we have trouble conceiving this. But as all the seven logic have emerged historically, there could be a new logic emerging uh, in which um, uh, um, I would say the ratings are the source of, uh, of legitimacy uh, and uh, the authority would not be uh, some kind of um, uh, hierarchical or otherwise uh, human uh, governance system, but it would be an algorithmic uh, governance uh, system. But what kind of uh, good it will do is, it, it still remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, you could argue that Uber in the US is a first prototype of a new institutional logic because in the US, in most states, Uber has been institutionalized differently from taxi companies. So they were able to create their own institutional space that allowed them to continue their business model up to today. Uh, but this, this logic could evolve uh, even further into an uh, artificial intelligence kind of, of logic. Um, so with this, I, uh, I end my presentation. I hope there's some room for questions.